There's a difference between flame resistant textiles and textiles that have been treated with flame retardants. Now flame resistant textiles are textiles that are inherently flame resistant, meaning there's actual elements based on the fibers they're made from that tend to resist flames. It's actually a part of the manufacturing process where either sometimes these fibers in and of themselves are resistant to flames or there might be some elements added in the manufacturing process that allows them to be more resistant to flames. Now there's no additional flame retardants added to these fabrics. In other words, there's no additional finish added after manufacturing to add flame retardant properties to those fabrics. Most of those fabrics, these flame resistant fabrics will heat up upon exposure to heat. However, they will tend to melt as opposed to transporting a flame across or they'll form a char, which is sort of a barrier to allowing further oxygen to enter in to allow the flame to propagate across the fabric. If a clothing item is not inherently flame resistant, there's a chance that some items based on occupational exposure or purposes of use might have flame retardants added to the textile to make them more resistant to exposure to flames. There are some occupations that are a high risk of exposure to flames, such as military as well as firefighters that might require having additional elements added to their clothing to make them more resistant to flames. There is another category that actually has flame retardants added to them, and that would be loose fitting pajamas based on legislation that was passed several decades ago. And we'll go over that in more detail in just a moment. So why would flame retardants even be added to clothing items, clothing items in particular that you're putting on your person? Let's go into a lot more details about this history between pajamas and flame retardants because there is a long-standing history here. In 1953, the Flammable Fabrics Act, also known as the FFA, was passed to regulate highly flammable materials such as children's pajamas after several tragic accidents happened in the 1940s. This act was amended in 1967 to include upholstery, carpets, and other textiles. This essentially required these textiles to pass flammability standards. In order to pass these standards, flame retardants were added to textiles to allow them to meet these regulations. In the 1970s, however, there were halogenated flame retardants or brominated and chlorinated flame retardants that were added to textiles that were identified as actually having carcinogenic and mutagenic properties to them. Many of these flame retardants were replaced, however, there's still flame retardants that could be used in certain circumstances. The other problem with these flame retardants is they were not only found to have an impact on our health, they were found to have an impact on the environment. Many of these flame retardants stayed persistent and they accumulate in the environment in house dust and people and in wildlife. Not only have these compounds been shown to be carcinogenic, mutagenic, they've also been found to be endocrine disrupting, meaning they can impact our hormonal balance, as well as potentially neurotoxic. Now hearing all of this, you might still wonder if the FFA is still in place, and yes it is. However, children's pajamas have changed since these factors were identified to figure out a way to kind of go around this regulation. And children's pajamas are still required to pass those flammability standards. For children's pajamas made for children aged 9 months to 14 years of age, they are still required to meet the FFA requirements if those pajamas are loose fitting. There are two ways to avoid pajamas made of textiles treated with flame retardants. One way to bypass these regulations is to actually have pajamas that are not loose fitting, but form fitting. So this way there's no extra fabric that's pulling away from the skin. That also means that there's less chances of that redundant fabric being caught up in a flame that can draw oxygen into the fabric and actually feed into the flame. So the ideal here is to actually have these fabrics form fitting so there's, there's less likelihood of this occurring. By having less fabric that's loose fitting and able to attract a flame to it if you walk past one, for example, but also having less ability for oxygen to get trapped between that fabric and your skin, then you're decreasing the flammability of those pajamas overall. Now remember, these laws were passed at a time that smoke detectors and other fire safety measures were simply not available. Now, if you really want to know if your clothing, the pajamas that you're choosing for your children are not treated with flame retardants, there's a simple way to find this out, and it's by looking at the tags attached to your garments. You may have noticed that there can be a yellow tag attached to children's pajamas that reads, for child safety, garments should fit snugly. These garments are not flame resistant, 
loose fitting garments are more likely to catch fire. That yellow tag that you've seen probably for years and wondered what it meant is actually related to this FFA regulation, where essentially they're informing the consumer that given the concerns that have arisen in the past, with flame retardant treated textiles, that the way that you can be sure that your garments that you're choosing at that time are not flame retardant treated is to have those snugly fit garments. So that way you're actually within the regulation, but also not exposing your child to those flame retardants. Now, another way to avoid flame retardants in your textiles, meaning treated within textiles, is to choose fabrics that are inherently flame resistant. And this generally means fabrics that are 100% polyester. Polyester in and of itself is inherently flame resistant. Now the tags on these garments may state that they are flame resistant. By stating flame resistant, it's stating that it wasn't treated with flame retardants, that they are inherently flame resistant. Although these endocrine disrupting and mutagenic flame retardants could potentially still be found in some pajamas. We don't find them very routinely anymore, only because manufacturers have found that if they can actually make these pajamas fit snugly or choose polyester fabrics, then they can actually still stay within the FFA standard without having to expose the consumer to further flame retardant usage. Now I've been asked in the past if there is a link between say juvenile diabetes or thyroid dysfunction and other factors that could be linked to these flame retardants. And it is true that although flame retardants are linked to endocrine disruption, there are a lot of other sources beyond clothing in the environment that could be a source for exposure to these chemicals as well as quite frankly plenty of others that have the same potential. So if you're looking to avoid this exposure in your fabrics and your clothing, definitely look for clothing that either has that yellow tag or it states that it's flame resistant. In terms of the actual exposures out there, there's a better chance that upholstery, carpets, curtains, other types of building materials have been treated with flame retardants, especially ones that were treated prior to the past decade where other flame retardants were still in use that had been linked to some of these same challenges. Now the story behind flame retardants in clothing is one that I always think is important to highlight only because it really highlights this concept that the association between functional fabrics or treating fabrics and our health and the environment is an evolving story and it's really been evolving over the past 20 to 50 years and something that we need to pay close attention to just trying to determine if it's absolutely necessary to do so there are plenty of other ways to achieve that flame resistant property without having to expose ourselves to further flame retardants there might be certain circumstances where flame retardants are essential, especially in certain lines of work, but we should be able to take measures to reduce our exposure to these products so that we can maintain that healthy balance. If you really think about this story with pajamas and flame retardants that were treated in them, that legislation was passed in the 50s and it wasn't until the 70s that these, that these chemicals were identified as having that carcinogenic or mutagenic property. Then it's hard to imagine how many people may have been exposed to those treated textiles for over a decade or two. That means an entire generation may have been exposed to them. So we have to be mindful of the fact that whenever we consider treating textiles, what that could mean for our overall health and the persistence of these chemicals in the environment. Now, how do flame retardants actually work? Flame retardants broadly fall under categories of organic or inorganic, and they often contain elements such as phosphorus containing, boron containing, halogen containing, such as bromine or chlorine, zinc or iron containing, carbon based. They can contain phosphorus, silicone, or nitrogen. There's a whole slew. There's there are hundreds and hundreds of flame retardant types of chemicals out there that are used in varying industries, not just in textiles. They can be used again in building materials, electronics, they can be used in clothing items, they can be used in carpets, upholstery. There are a variety of usages for these flame retardants out there. Now, when a flame retardant is added to a textile, it's generally added as a finish or an additive to the textile after the textile is already manufactured. So you're taking a textile that's inherently not flame resistant and you're adding that flame retardant to it to decrease its flammability overall. For a textile to actually burn, first a flame is introduced to the textile. Air or oxygen feeds into that flame to allow it to propagate or spread. 
After that, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere and heat is transferred back into the garment that allows that flame to propagate across the textile. Now a flame retardant, when it's added to a textile, will seek to stop the propagation of the flame across the textile by inhibiting the ability of oxygen to feed back into that flame. So generally speaking, there might be a char created, sort of a barrier created, that blocks the ability of oxygen to re-enter the garment. This basically isolates the flame from its oxygen source that stops it from propagating. Now the flame retardants you're going to hear most about when it comes to textiles and clothing and upholstery are usually the brominated flame retardants that contain bromine and organophosphate flame retardants also referred to as OPFRs. The polychlorinated biphenols which are the PCBs and the polybrominated diphenyl ethers, also known as PDBEs, common in the past, but phased out about a decade ago. But remember the PCBs and the PDBEs, although they've been phased out overall, may still be present in textiles and garments that were upholstery items that were made over a decade ago. The problem with these particular chemicals is they do not chemically bind to the textile, so they are easily released into the air and into dust. Now it's the PCBs and the PDBEs in particular that have been linked to thyroid dysfunction and exposure during pregnancy has been shown to put children at risk for motor, cognitive, and behavioral impacts up through school age. Now the phosphorus containing flame retardants have been linked to asthma and allergies as they were found in dust mite according to a study about 10 years ago. Studies have also shown that those chemicals can impact our bone health and brain health as well. Now there are several ways that flame retardants can affect our skin. The first is somewhat obvious with direct contact with their skin. Now there are very few scant case reports on contact dermatitis associated with flame retardants, but the reality with this conversation when it comes to contact dermatitis is simply put that there is not a lot of data out there on how to test for those actual reactions as well as quite frankly what's in our clothing. Again, we do not have an ingredient label, that privilege of being able to know what our clothing items were treated with, so we are left to figuring it out based on claims. So if there is a garment that's been made with the intent for, say for an occupational hazard of being exposed to flames, then there's a better likelihood than not that flame retardants may have been added to it. So we are left with understanding this sort of indirectly. For example, there was a study that was performed as a survey to people that were exposed to flame retardants in their clothing as per their occupation. And about a third of people that responded to that survey did claim that those clothing items, when they wore them, made them feel itchier or they developed rashes as a result of exposure to those clothing items. The hard part about the study is they really couldn't identify if it was the flame retardant causing those challenges or if it was care of those garments in terms of how frequently they laundered those garments. Ultimately, however, the way to reduce that tendency to the exposure in terms of a contact dermatitis would be to layer, meaning putting a layer in between your skin and the flame retardant treated garment that actually protects your skin from exposure to it directly. There was a more recent report that came out that actually was trying to find a link between a group of people that were developing a skin form of lymphoma called mycosis fungoides and their exposure to flame retardants in their clothing. It appeared that in this study there was a group of firefighters, for example, that were exposed to the same type of garments that were developing a skin form of lymphoma called mycosis fungoides that was hard to say if there was a direct connection between that exposure and these garments. This is something that needs further research to understand, but it only highlights how challenging it can be to really develop an understanding of the exposure of these chemicals and our skin and the risk that it places our skin at from that exposure. Now studies have also shown that outside of just direct contact with our skin with the epidermis is that these chemicals can be absorbed into the skin, what we call dermal absorption, which is that second layer of skin. And that is where they can, where they can have that potential impact on our endocrine. And that is where you hear about the potential impact on endocrine and hormonal function. So what do you do with this information? The key here is to understand that if you are at risk, 
for an occupational exposure to any of these items and it's worthy of looking for flame resistant materials as opposed to materials that were treated with flame retardants. This is also very common in baby items such as cribs, strollers, car seats for example. The intent is to reduce the flammability of these items given the risks that could be posed to the children. However, there are some other ways of achieving this and companies have become savvier to this need. So looking for companies that have actually disclosed whether or not they use flame retardants in their items or they're simply using flame resistant materials can give you more confidence as a consumer as to whether or not you're placing your skin or your health at risk for exposure to these chemicals.